Welcome uh, to the Royal Society of Victoria. It's my pleasure to be the president. I've been a, I explained to people, I've been a member since uh, soon after I graduated in 1900 and frozen to death and uh, not done a lot for a whole long, for a long period of time. Uh, but I'm thoroughly enjoying where we're taking the Royal Society of Victoria nowadays. Uh, and I'll talk to you a bit, bit more about that in a minute. Uh, so welcome everybody uh, to those of you here in person at the Society in the, in the Ellery Theatre but also uh, have many people on Zoom, on the Zoom webinar, and others online live streamed via YouTube. And Mike's telling me we have about 200 registered on, on Zoom tonight, and there's already about 100 uh, there waiting to talk to us, so welcome to you guys as well. Uh, before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that all of us uh, in Australia are located on the traditional lands of this continent's first scientists, the many different First Nations people who belong to the diverse lands and waters of this remarkable region of our planet. Uh, we're coming to you tonight from Melbourne in the Port Phillip region, a region called Nam, by the peoples of the Kulin Nation who have lived in this country for tens of thousands of years. Uh, we're specifically located on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Woiwurrung language group, and I invite everyone joining tonight, uh, either via Zoom's webinar chat function or via YouTube's comments section, uh, for those following on the live stream, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of your own local country and join me in paying respects to elders past and present, and we likewise extend that uh, respect to any Indigenous Australians who have joined us at this meeting tonight. Uh, we'll be hearing from our speaker, Dr Philip Zilstra, very soon. But first, we're delighted to have Uncle Dave Wandon, an elder of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung, with us tonight, to gen who's generously offered to uh, offer a formal welcome to country. Welcome, Dave. Thank you, Rob. Before I start my welcome, I want to pay my respects to you, Rob. That is the first time that I've been introduced and we have been recognised as the first scientists of this country. Um, I know many people talk about it. That's the first time I've ever heard it spoken out loud in public for people to hear. That normally forms a part of my welcome so you can get an understanding of why Aboriginal people can sometimes be a bit frustrated in the way that our landscapes are managed. Because you are correct, for 60,000 years plus, we have been collecting data, we've been analysing it, and we've been making decisions on country. At the time of colonisation, people did not understand our scientific ways uh, and it is that lack of understanding, that lack of communication that has led us to what we are facing today. Um, and hopefully through these kind of platforms we can change that perception and gain recognition for our not superior knowledge but our knowledge and the data that we do have in our collective oral history and we have it in our own books except we didn't write books, we read country. And that's what I do as an educator, is try and teach people, yes, we can all pick up a book and we can get on Google, but learn how to read country. Not just walk through it and say, isn't it pretty? And, or, you know, oh, this doesn't look really good. The government should do something about it. I think we can all collectively, by understanding what's wrong, listening to our Aboriginal people and you can apply your own medicine to heal country. Um, so thank you very, very much. Yes, my name is Dave Wandon and I'm an elder of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Tribal Land Council on whose lands we are gathered today. It is the land of my ancestors and most people think that's the end of it. But it is still my land today. It is the land for my children, my grandchildren and now my great-grandchildren. And I pay my respects to my elders and ancestors, both past, present and our young people, our next emerging elders, for the knowledge that they have been able to pass on to me, that I can pass down to my community, but also with platforms like this that I can pass on to people who either live, work or play on Wurundjeri country. Because when you are on country, you have a responsibility to the country. And I pay my respects to all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that are with us today, either in person or online, to their ancestors and elders, both past, present and emerging, for the opportunity that I have had since 2012 to ask them the questions, to fill in the gaps in my knowledge and hopefully reinforce some of the gaps in theirs. And that is happening. And it's amazing that we, I grew up thinking, yes, our culture is lost. I used to consider myself to be an urbanised Aboriginal living in Melbourne and there was no place for my culture. But as I moved back to the town of my birth, which is Hillsville, and started to walk around country, 
and my father started to teach me the little bit that he knew, I realised there was an important role for Aboriginal to play in protecting the landscape. Not only to return it back to what it once was, but to leave something for the future. Not our children that we have now, but for the children we haven't even begun to imagine that are not yet born. And as when I, if I can't do a smoking ceremony around here, but one of the ways of reading that story is thinking about the children are not yet born brings us back to a process of doing a smoking ceremony and using a combination of leaves. And some of those leaves are for our unborn children, thinking about we are the parents, even though we may never meet those children. I also want to pay my respects to my creator spirit, Bunjil, the wedge-tailed eagle. He is our creator father, who gave us the laws of the land which we know as Wurundjeri. People say L-O-R-E, law, but the reality is in this day and age, we have to work under laws, L-A-W-S. He gave us many laws, and they are as complicated as what modern society lives under today. We had many, many ways of controlling community, controlling resources, controlling borders, policing, uh, our health system, our marriage system, all of these things that we all had to learn as we become young adults and when we eventually became elders as elected by our individual communities. But Bunjil gave us first law and he said if you can't remember first law there's no point trying to learn the rest because it all stems from first law. And first law is that you must respect your mother. Not only your physical mother that you are born from, who is the person that nurtures you and protects you, gives you your first feed. She is the one that when you are young and defenceless, alongside the rest of the family and your community, that clothes you and feeds you, looks after you when you are sick, teaches you to walk and talk, how to feed yourself. But as, of course, as you grow older and a little bit stronger, you become independent and eventually you become older and stronger and our physical mother, her health does deteriorate. And we must remember what she did to us, for us, when we were children. And we return that favour to her when she can no longer go out and harvest, when she can no longer clothe herself. Now, that's human society, not just Aboriginal society. But the other half of that is the spirit of our mother, which is our country, which is the land on which we work, which we work and play on and what we extract our resources from just as we extracted them from our mother when we could not, our physical mother, when we could not do it for ourselves. And that's very, very important to not treat country as something separate from humanity. For us, culturally, it is a part of humanity. When we're walking on the land, we are walking on the body of our mother. When we're swimming in the waterways, we are swimming through her veins. How do you match that up together in the modern day? Well, it's very simple. Mother Earth has been looking after us and providing us with the resources that our physical mother gave us when we were young. When we get older for our physical mother, we pay that back. And I think as a society today, as we've got older, our mother Earth is also getting older. And she is tired because we are not looking after her anymore. Because we have forgotten our ways, or so I thought. Aboriginal people have not forgotten. It's taken a long time for our knowledge to be recognised that it's an integral part of biodiversity to keep this Australian landscape in the best condition that we can. It was unique when colonists first got here. It was unique when our people first came here. It can still be unique in the world infrastructure, but only if we remember to care for the spirit of our mother. It is only by walking country, walking with mother, the spirit of our mother, together both indigenous science and modern science, that we can start to heal country together. And as we heal country, just like we look after our physical mother in early age, she will reward us. Let's walk country together, heal country together, and eventually we can truly call ourselves Australians. If we're not looking after country, you're not Australian. You must look after country first, and then country will look after you. And all the other problems, will start to fall away. When you walk out and you see healthy country, when you walk away uh, from your mother, if she, if she is getting older and she needs looking up, walk away and know that she is cared for, you actually walk away spiritually feeling healthier 
and that will then give you the drive to go on and do what you need to do in your day-to-day -day work, looking after the rest of your family, looking after country, looking after your friends and your family and your community. I don't speak much language, but I'll give three words. Waminjika, Wurundjeri, Biak, and welcome to Wurundjeri country. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Um, Dave's become a frequent guest at the Society uh, and he's greatly valued because um, he has specialised knowledge of his own in caring for country, as he's demonstrated, uh, but particularly in uh, the use of fire and healing and managing ecological and agricultural health of land around his home, as he mentioned, at, uh, at Corran Dirk uh, at Hillsville in the northeast area of Nam. So thanks very much for being with us, Dave. I want to make, just before we before I introduce Phil, um, there are many members of the Royal Society with us tonight, and there are some people who aren't members of the Royal Society, and many more online who aren't members of the Royal Society. May I encourage you either to, we don't print many of these, but I'm going to make a special mention of our editor, uh, Scott Redyex, who's done a remarkable job this year in building up uh, Science Victoria, our magazine. It's now uh, a very, very valuable document. For those of you here, for those of you online who are members or here who are members, please, your copy that's been sent to you digitally, we'd love you to send it to somebody else. We'd like you to send it to whomever you like. We'd also like encourage you to take note that we are now encouraging affiliate organisations to join the Royal Society of Victoria. So that's other non-profits. Uh, our view now is that this originally was a place, a public place where science was discussed back in the late 1850s, and we want to reinvigorate it for that purpose. So for other uh, non-profit organisations that want to affiliate with the Royal Society, use our building, have your meetings here, but so we can actually have a, a number of science-based and uh, technical-based organisations speaking with one voice about science is very important. And similarly, and you find opportunities to do that in the magazine, and similarly, we're now encouraging organisational members to do exactly the same. For science and technical-based companies to join the Royal Society to promote, help us promote science-based decision-making. And I'm sure that most of you here will be uh, supportive of that view. So uh, can I encourage you to join if you're not already a member. We have a growing membership. I think a membership's grown about 20% in the last 12 months, and we'd like to continue that because we need to develop a strong cohort and promote as a group science-based decision-making as it was in the old days. Uh, thanks indeed, Dave. Uh, let me now introduce Phil, who's just jumped off a plane. He's dressed like a Queenslander. I don't know whether he actually realises <laughs> that it's actually Melbourne's wintertime. Uh, He's very, uh, Phil's very kindly uh, joined us tonight from New South Wales uh, to share in his scholarship uh, this evening. Um, he's come into bushfire research from a background in fire management and remote area firefighting. Since that time, he's developed the first and only peer reviewed fire behaviour model for most Australian forests, as well as the first model globally to calculate the direct effects of fire on flora, fauna, and soils. His work focuses on understanding the ways that our inter interaction with forests affect fire risk. Using fire history analysis and state-of-the-art modelling, Phil's work reconciles deep knowledge from First Peoples with forest ecology and a complex understanding of fire behaviour to provide critically needed guidance in fire management. Phil is Adjunct Associate Professor for the Curtin University School of Mole Molecular and Life Sciences in Perth and Research Associate at the University of New South Wales. Please welcome Phil Zilter. Come up, Phil. I was just having a chat with Dave earlier and he started doing some cool burning about, let's say, eight years ago, inside the last decade. Inside the last decade. And I would be fair to say that in the last five years or so, the whole notion of fire and forests has really escalated. Because I, I, I know I've been talking to any politician that cares to listen about uh, the notion of um, fuel reduction burning, let's call it that. Uh, my parents, having spent two nights on the end of the pier at Lawn, uh, one well before Ash Wednesday and one on Ash Wednesday, and I used to ask politicians, for how long do you think there'll be a window when we could actually set fire to forests to manage to use that technique to reduce fuel loads? No one seems to have an answer to that, so I'm hoping that you might come up with that tonight. How did you get actually into this 
latest bit. Where did you come from? You were, I mean, re what did I say? Remote area of fire management or something like that. That's not the same as what you're doing now, is it? How did you get to no. where you are? So I, yeah, um, I originally was was working on um, grazing properties on the Monero, um, southeast of New South Wales, and um, uh, just just always interested in in the the bit of fire work that I was doing there for graziers, and um, yeah, I think uh, it, the idea of going into science had been playing on my mind for a long time. And um, and one day I broke the news in the shearing shed and uh, <laughs> said I'm going to do a degree and there was just awed silence through the shed. <laughs> was there really? I can imagine. I can so, imagine. Yeah. So um, yeah. It. I mean, I I have have come towards this after after having to implement what we knew of fire science already and seeing the bits that worked and the bits that didn't work, and my focus was always. Uh, you know, is this actually improving our decision making? It, I, I didn't want something that was theoretically true, but didn't actually improve decisions on the ground or improve the way we managed the land. And, and that led me into doing further research. I was going to make a comment after Dave spoke, and it, we'll get him to make some reflections after your presentation, that the intersection of the knowledge that first peoples have and the, the science we know about since about 1400, that intersection is becoming really interesting. So you're actually also saying that it's your first-hand experience before you learned that traditional science, which is a, which has led you to that, but it is also you're integrating with it. So I think that's a it's a really interesting, really interesting spot to be. Let's hear from you, and we'll have plenty of time. Plenty of people here. We'll have lots of questions later. I know we have a really interested audience. Thank you for coming down from New South Wales. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you. It's often said that um, a lot of First Nations knowledge has been lost. And, and I heard you, Uncle Dave, sort of using, um, using these sorts of terms that people have, have used for a long time. And I think it's a, it's a kind of a, um, we need to speak a little bit more brutally about this. It wasn't lost, it was taken. It was smashed, it was stolen. Uh, there's, there was absolute injustice through this, but it wasn't all lost and it wasn't all stolen because I, for example, know a, a lady whose grandmother hid in the ferns when the government cars would come around and she eluded the government cars for long enough that she learnt from her parents and her grandparents and was able to hold on to some of that knowledge. Um, you know, I know of people who uh, who were taken, who who lived on missions, but who spent their time secretly whispering in forbidden languages in back rooms and, and in, in paddocks and telling each other stories and maintaining these histories. And these bits of knowledge have stayed with us and they're like refugia in the landscape, like, like seeds that are waiting there to grow. And these are the things that I was exposed to early on in my work in fire management uh, that really got me thinking in a different way about fire and questioning so much of what we were doing there. Because you see, as we've said, First Nations were the first scientists. We have to think that if you have a culture that can survive 65,000 years or more, you're on to something. And so if we are doing good science now, it should start converging. There shouldn't be conflicts. But my concern is that what we are talking about with science now, with fire science, uh, has some fatal flaws in it that were very apparent to me when I worked with it. And that these flaws are not science. What they are is old colonial thinking that's got a bit of lipstick on it. Where we're trying to dress up this old knowledge as if this is science, as if this is something that uh, should now be a guiding principle. So when we have people who have indigenous heritage 
but their, their parents, their grandparents were stolen. They had the knowledge bashed out of them in many cases. Um, we have people trying to resurrect that knowledge. And as a culture, we're offering these tools. We're offering science to say, here, try and rebuild it. But so much of that science has built into it our old colonial invasion thinking. And so we have this way now where we can look as if we're stepping back as a culture, as if we're giving over autonomy and uh, land ownership again and, and we're reconciling things. But while we're doing that as a society, there are aspects of the thinking, the core paradigms behind it all that we are passing on so that the colonisation still continues. We can't just say we're handing over land titles. We have to step back further with our thinking and we have to revisit the way we do science. And, there, and we can do that by doing better science to start with. We can also do it by listening and by thinking what do these different ideas mean? And that's what first challenged me. This is a red tingle tree, uh, Eucalyptus jacksonii in southwestern Australia. I've been doing a bit of work in this area here. Incredible trees, they, the, the base of them flanges right out. You can see the enormous hollow in there was caused by a previous fire. And what happens is that right at the base of the tree, you can, you can see this sort of gap at the base there. There's a, there's a kind of a weakness between the base of the tree and the lignotuber, and, and even the mildest fire can get in there and enter uh, a, a secure tree base, and that causes a hollow. So one fire will give you a hollow in a tree like that. The next fire or the one after it will drop the tree. So in that country, Uncle Wayne Webb and his son here in the photo, Zach, they're the two last living speakers of the Wadandi language. Uncle Wayne is Wadandi Pippenman Yunangyalu Elder from the area. He grew up on country, grew, knew the, uh, the traditions. There were a lot that was still intact for the area. He has such a deep knowledge of this country there. And he's very eloquent, he's recognised, he's, he's got an honorary doctorate. Now, as you can see, the way he's worded this about the Tingle country is He's not mincing words. He's not hard to understand. He's telling us directly, please don't burn this country. I didn't burn these tingle trees. My people didn't burn these tingle trees. These need fire excluded from them. Then we have land management agencies who are hearing this, who say is their official position that we are continuing ancient traditional knowledge. We are continuing uh, our prescribed burning program is a continuation of this old knowledge. And here is someone with the old knowledge speaking up saying, no, 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 that isn't the old knowledge. Please don't do that. And it's falling on deaf ears. And why is that? Because what we are calling fire science is saying he can't be right. We can't listen to this man. We can't listen to people like um, Adi Lynette, who uh, she's in neighbouring country. Um, she's a Meninga elder. She wasn't taken because when they came to take her siblings, she was quite sick, had an ongoing illness at the time. And as a result, she got to stay with her parents, got to continue learning from her parents. And so she now takes people out on country in the neighbouring forests to these Tingle ones. And she says, here are the patches that we burn. And we burn this in a way where um, I can control this with a green branch. I control this patch here. I've got you and mates on the south coast of New South Wales who, who will light up a patch and they'll sit and watch to see if the insects are able to move away from the flame faster than the, th than the flames are spreading. There's this level of meticulous detail and Auntie Lynette would say, we'll burn that patch, but we don't burn that patch. Same as further east in the great western woodlands. Um, we have the, um, the, the 
the colour for that country, the, the fire knowledge for that country there says, yes, you can burn these tea tree thickets, but you can't burn the salmon gum here because what you do when you burn the salmon gum is you cause these dense thickets to come back up because it's a very fire sensitive plant. So we will burn these little patches around our campsite here, but we will we'll brush the litter away from the base of these trees. And, and we're only just burning these bits here so that we can use these campsites. It's this detailed, complex knowledge. The first man that opened my eyes to it was Uncle Rod Mason down in southeastern Australia. You'd know him. Yep. Yeah. And Uncle Rod used to talk about waru for country, that, um, that you, you know the stories and the connections in your country that tell you where fire belongs and where it doesn't belong. But if you move across into somebody else's country, and you don't know those stories and those connections, then you come in like an infant. You don't have the waru for that country. You can't just say, I now understand fire. You, you have to come into new country and learn the new thinking there. It is complex. This is Richard Swain, a mate of mine. He's a Wiradjuri man who was born and grew up, lived his whole life in the Snowy Mountains, which is... Uh, which is my my heartland. Richard knows the Snowy River in the background probably better than just about any person alive. He uh, he travels this constantly on foot, on uh, kayak. Um, he has spent his life sitting at the feet of the elders of this country, of learning what he can, and his his knowledge of the area is is absolutely vast. And he'll take you through there and show you. Um, wherever you go, he will know a tree to point out to you where he can, he can show you how some change has happened in, in that landscape in the past. Now, it's on this snowy river that um, a study released recently introduced this concept of settler mimicry burning. Settler mimicry burning is a term for a concept that has been around for a while, this idea that Aboriginal fire management was picked up by settlers and continued on to some extent, maybe not, maybe imperfectly, but, but we've got remnants of it continuing through there. So if we move away from the type of, of um, fire use that, that farmers have used historically, then we're moving away from Aboriginal fire. Richard was particularly stirred by this study and with good reason. The word settler is an interesting word because it's got a nice gentle sound to it, like snow settling on the ground. We tend not to talk about asteroids settling amongst the dinosaurs. <laughs> you know, we, but the settlers were somewhere on that spectrum and usually not on the snow end of it. These people here, uh, not in Australia, this is burning more land in the British uplands. And they're doing this because when you burn the heather, you start a chain of events where regrowth from the heather attracts grouse and grouse attract rich guys with guns. Um, and so burning heather is, is a long-term tradition in the, in the British uplands and it's how the grazing lands were created up there because if you don't burn the heather, trees start to come back. And the reason for that is that these areas that we think of as moors, as ancient landscapes, in the Iron Age were forests. Um, so these guys, through thousands of years of tradition of burning this heather country, in the 19th century, quite a lot of these people migrated to Australia, like this man, Angus Macmillan, which, which many of you will be familiar with. Um, a Scottish settler. Um, Angus Macmillan is the man that opened up the, um, the grazing country through the Snowy Mountains, through Gippsland. Um, he brought his, um, his stock down uh, and he came down with a number of other sort of highlanders through the area there. And the way Angus Macmillan settled these areas was through a series of events, such as the time that he and the Highlanders during the night came and surrounded um, a group 
of the local Indigenous people in the dark, surrounded their campsite, waited for first light, then opened fire and massacred every man, woman and child in that campsite. Over 100 people. The numbers are uncertain because um, it wasn't discovered straight away. Nobody necessarily has found all of the bodies. Um, one of the greatest mass murderers in our country's history. And it's almost certain that the men on either side of him there, including the man made to hold his hand, are survivors of one of his massacres. Which chills me when I look at the man's face. These are the people that we're calling settlers. And the next part of that term, settler mimicry, suggests that you have learned something and copied something. When I first asked Uncle Rod about fire, um, he told me an answer that was quite simple. And, and I wondered, you know, is, is that all there is to it? And it was a year later, I think, that I came back and I asked him something else. And, and his next answer was different enough that it intrigued me. And then I kept asking more. And what stood out to me and what I, I, I learned over time is that uh, in an oral society where you can't just give somebody a book, you can't just tell your students, sit down and pay attention and, and write an essay on this, uh, the onus is on the student to learn. When you come and you say, please teach me, you get the answer that gets given to the four-year-old. And that's what I got the first time I asked. It is up to me to keep coming back and keep saying, please teach me more. You can't learn 65,000 years of knowledge by saying, please tell me about fire. You have to keep coming back and coming back and learning this nuance and this complexity. And my question is, did any of these people have the commitment to come and do that? Did Angus Macmillan sit at the feet of First Nations and say, please teach me, you know about this and I don't? Because if he didn't, then what he's doing wasn't mimicking them because he didn't know what they were doing. And what so many farmers have done through history there, and I, and I don't want to paint everybody with the same brush. I don't want to compare farmers to Angus Macmillan. It's, that would be deeply unfair. There were, there were monsters in the past and there have been really good people in the past. And I, I, I worked with many really good people on the Monero, um, beautiful people. But what I never saw was a culture of people who would sit down and say, I really, really want to learn this. And so as a result, what we had was people who were used to this use of fire which was to clear country, to create country for grazing of the animals that they brought across to Australia. It was a utilitarian approach. It was a colonising approach where you come to a place and you say, I'm going to change this place to make it suit my way of thinking and my way of living. And so as a result, elders in the past used to tell people like Dame Mary Gilmore that colonists lit fires and let them run like a child that loved destruction because they didn't understand these complexities of the places where fire belongs and where it doesn't belong. So this is a prescribed burn I conducted in my time working in fire management there. And the reason for the prescribed burn was to deal with this leaf litter on the ground. And this is where a lot of the science comes back to, is managing the leaf litter on the ground. Um, and, and it's interesting because some of the earliest um, settlers talked about the leaf litter and again it came from the reason they used fire. It came from the concept of getting the litter off the ground so that we can get fresh grass and good growth for stock to eat. What has grown in more recent years though is, is this concept that somehow or other we have picked up and mimicked ancient knowledge. And this really picked up during the 19 late 50s and into the 1960s. And this is a, a quote from poss possibly the world's foremost fire historian, Stephen Pine. Um, he'd spoken to Alan MacArthur, who was kind of the, you know, the if Australia has a, a, a fire god in white Australian culture, it's Alan MacArthur. <laughs> you know, he's, he's the guy. 
He's the man that, that got the whole prescribed burning system kicked off, particularly in the east of the country. Um, and so he's saying that we replaced fire sticks, we made it better by throwing out incendiaries from planes. Um, he also said that we have now replaced those capsules with lasers. Um, now, when I did fire management, we had fleets of helicopters flying over blocks. We had teams of people sometimes running along the edges with drip torches. We had quad bikes firing from automated incendiary launches. Uh, the fellow I worked for was trying to get, uh, get things sorted out so that he could get a vehicle mounted flamethrower. <laughs> the thing was, uh, there was this window of opportunity when it's safe to do prescribed burns and you've got a target of hectares that you have to meet. If you want to burn a certain number of hectares and, um, and manage the fuels over a certain area, then the moment the weather is right, you've got to get in there and you have to get it burning as fast as possible. Never once did I use lasers. So the thing is, Stephen Pine, who wrote this book, this is one of the books, there's a, there's a small collection of these writings from which we get a lot of our, our Australian fire myth that somehow prescribed burning is a continuation of Aboriginal burning. Stephen Pine was one of the people who helped to create this story. And I want to point out that he was talking to Alan MacArthur. He was able to get the information directly from him and yet somehow or other lasers got into that conversation when they don't exist in this environment. And so if, if lasers were able to enter this conversation, then how much confidence can we have that the story about Aboriginal burning is correct when he didn't have Aboriginal elders there to ask? One of the great questions for me is if we had these teams working flat out, this huge industry to burn as much country as we possibly could, and yet every time there's a fire that happens, uh, we're told, uh, well, it's because we haven't done enough of this burning. We didn't do an, as much burning, as much fuel reduction as Aboriginal people did. How did Aboriginal people burn more than we do in bare feet with fire sticks, watching to see if the insects are moving faster than the flames? I mean, you think how much country you get burnt in a day. My experience of Indigenous burning and what I've been taught to celebrate as a very successful burn is a maximum, an absolute maximum of no more than 80 hectares. And that was with working with a team of all Aboriginal people who are recognised fire knowledge holders. I know what you're talking about in prescribed burning where they go out and they advertise and we're going to do a thousand hectares, 800 hectares and, all, and you're going to do it in eight hours mm -hmm. and then you're going to spend the next three days blacking it out. Um, and that is definitely the wrong way to do it. You've got to be able to walk with fire. Um, I know that when you do forest fire management, you've got to you know, wear the big shiny yellow coats. Uh, you've got to have all the first aid around the, the ambulances in case someone does get burnt. You've got to have an extraction process. The way that I demonstrate burning or cool burning as it's being termed, I've been taking my grandchildren, I started taking them out when they were eight and nine years old, burning in the bush with me for the express reason to be able to show them that the right fire for the right country, that they can observe the insects that are moving in front of the fire or are climbing up the trees. And as soon as the fire passes underneath it, they'll come back down again. Watching the, um, the lizards and the snakes going down into the holes in the ground. And again, once the fire passes, they'll come back out again. Mm -hmm. So it's not about clearing land for human safety. That's a byproduct of indigenous mm. burning. We're clearing land for everything that lives within it, yep. all the indigenous animals, because they are all someone's, somewhere, their totemic symbol. And under Bunjil's law, we are required to protect and preserve all totems, whether we like them or not. So in reference, I'll use, you know, nobody likes snakes. So if a snake gets caught in a fire, well, that's, you know, who cares? But a snake is someone's totem. And it's our responsibility as fire elders um, to, when we apply our methodology 
for when an area is ready to be burnt. It is about understanding, well, what are the snakes doing at this time of the year? What are the birds doing? What are the, what are the marsupials doing? What are the insects doing? And everything else, that, uh, the bats. Nobody ever thinks about the bats that are you know, behind the bark of the trees. Um, and if you know, one tree gets burnt, it really doesn't matter. Well, that's against law about burning trees. Mm. Yes, we do have to remove the leaf litter. But if we do, if Indigenous people were allowed to burn the way um, that we know, uh, without interference, and we can only get 80 hectares done in a day. It's not this one day of, of opportunity. There's multiple months throughout the year. Our burning time is right now. Mm. I was burning last week. I'll be burning on the weekend. Mm. And they're not even 80 hectares. They're a couple of acres. Because that's the only area that I'm... You know, this is private people offering me my la their land, which they know is on my ancestral lands, because they have faith in the system. I've already demonstrated to them on their properties and they allow me to come back, but they don't own 80 hectares. So I've got to work to these fence lines, uh, which makes it very difficult to do. But uh, we have a much bigger window of opportunity to do indigenous burning than we do prescribed burning. Uh, and indigenous burning is not based on economics. It's not based on fuel reduction. That is a byproduct of indigenous burning. It's not based on uh, human protection or asset protection, uh, as in a, a power station or a town. The asset is the actual bush that you're burning yourself, is what we're doing. The other asset protection is a byproduct. The asset is everything that's actually living in that forest, that's living in that wetland or living in that grassland. That's the asset that you're actually using fire to protect, not for economic benefit further down the line. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, Dave. And, and just to be clear, I didn't set him up to say any of this <laughs> stuff. It's sort this of, this it's is the first the, time that we have yeah. met. Yes. Yeah. Uh, as he walked in the door, this is the first time I've met this, this gentleman. Uh, and I was actually wondering whether um, we would be in conflict by the end of the day. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. And if we were, that's probably a good thing because yeah. anything yeah. that stimulates conversation yeah. hopefully works towards conciliation, yeah. but respecting each other's uh, knowledge bases and seeing how they can work together, just like I say, walk in country together, um, we can come up with a solution that will work in this modern day and age. I'm not saying that Aboriginal fire is the answer mm. because the landscape has definitely changed in the last 200 years. I'm not saying we should stop uh, all controlled burns because by doing absolutely nothing at all, you will inevitably change nature anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, it is about finding that medium that, and it's very hard to please everybody, we know that, uh, but there is a way. We can't, but we can't stop doing what we're doing now and say, give it all back to the Aboriginal people. I would love that to happen. Mm -hmm. The reality is we need to work this together and we will come up with a solution. Yeah. Not one way though, yeah. not the other way. It's got to be, uh, we've got to find that happy medium and we'll get there. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, so 80 hectares, I remember burns that we did that were 10,000 yeah. in a day. Um, and when I work in Southwest WA, I'm constantly told you, you people are, are wusses who do no burning, you know, like they're, they're, they're burning multiple burns of multiple tens of thousands of hectares in a day and to be fair they don't have hills you know it's a it's flat country with roads and no complex weather to to deal with most of the time um so um but even then every time there's a big fire it's we still must not be burning enough and which reminds me a little bit of you know you know sacrificing a goat to bring the rain and the rain doesn't come and your answer is, well, we need to burn more goats. You know, we, um, you, you can reinforce your thinking rather than questioning. And when you think about how did you, how did First Nations burn so much more country than we are burning now, the only answer that I keep coming down to, and, and people don't like saying this up front, um, but if you keep questioning it and pushing it, eventually you come down to this answer that Stephen Pine's given us with flaming firebrands, dribbling embers everywhere, um, people walking around with fire sticks that they had to reignite, not by holding it underneath another fire stick and getting that one going, but by lighting forest litter and grassy tussocks. 
what he's saying is they burnt so much country by accident. Fires that escaped by lighting grassy tussocks, by firebrands drooping off you as you're walking along. This is, this is the theory of how so much of Australia was burnt prior to colonisation. Incompetence. Let's get into the science of it now, of, of what actually has, has been picked up on this thinking, what's been encapsulated into scientific papers and reproduced one paper citing another, citing another, until over time it all looks as if, wow, there's a huge literature saying this, but if you chase them all back, you come back to a tiny handful of sources and it comes from another colonial experience. This photo I took from the Texas Journal Garden and Gun. <laughs> The, the fellow there with, a, with the walking stick is looking at his plantation of longleaf pine. Now, in this story, he goes through how the fact that he bought up land that was, um, was oak forest, and he knew in his heart that it should be longleaf pine, which incidentally happens to be a much more expensive timber species. Um, and... The natural succession of these forests is that you, um, after disturbance, the first plants that come back are longleaf pine with this grassy understory, but eventually you start getting in um, oaks and other, other trees that are shadier trees. They create a, a much darker, shadier microclimate. And once they're in, you actually can't burn the country. Fires stop when they get to this country. And that's bad. I say, because you can't do prescribed burns to prevent fire. <laughs> but the issue with these guys, too, he, he couldn't burn it to get his longleaf pines going and, and restore the country. So the way he did it was literally, he said, he poisoned every single plant in this whole block that he bought, absolutely nuked all life in this place and planted it out with longleaf pine. And he presents it in, in Garden and Gun as an act of conservation. Now, the reason I mention this is because back in the 1950s, there was, uh, there was the budding areas of fire science growing in America because people were burning these longleaf pine forests and needed to keep burning them as regularly as they could to stop succession from happening, which they called invasion. And so we wanted, they wanted science to understand the best ways to burn this. Now, there's, it's a pretty simple setup. You've got your product, which is the tree, the timber, and you've got on the ground a mixture of grass and pine needles. So one is the fuel, one is the thing you're trying to save from the fire. So the fuel is a, a really nice, simple arrangement. So we got this idea that fuel load is the litter load on the ground. And that's what went into the first fire models and that then got translated into Australia, where we have messier bush. And again, we said the fuel load is the litter load. And again, the litter had been demonised for a long time because remember, the litter kills off the nice fresh grass. So it fit quite easily into our Australian setting here. And um, the fellow that brought this was Alan MacArthur, introduced the idea. He was quite upfront. He wasn't trying to write the Bible for us, but it became the Bible. He told us this was a back of the envelope calculation that um, it may be completely wrong. Now, since then, considerable research has gone into looking into whether it actually is right or not. Because his argument was that if you double the fuel load, you double the rate of spread of fire. And that became the basis for prescribed burning. That's the foundation of prescribed burning. If you want a slower fire, then you reduce the fuel load. Um, during the 90s, Dr Neil Burrows in WA conducted manipulative experiments, which are the most, uh, most sound way of determining cause and effect. Uh, rather than just conducting 
experiments in the bush where you might have things that are correlated together and it's a little bit hard to tease them apart. Dr. Burroughs manipulated fuel loads in a wind tunnel environment and he found that fuel load has absolutely no effect on rate of spread. And that should have been the end of it. He had disproved the idea. You know, homeopathy doesn't cure cancer. So more work went on following then. Uh, a big series of experimental fires in the same forests yet again. Um, MacArthur had come up with his double the fuel load, double the rate of spread by looking at Jarrah forests in WA. Neil Burrows had, had repeated the experiments in wind tunnels using that Jarrah fire, Jarrah litter for his, uh, for his fire experiments. Um, the Project Vesta experiments were again carried out in these WA forests. It was a multi-million dollar program. The most recent publication from them said that if you've only got litter burning, you've got what they call a stage one fire, which is a small, slow fire with small flames, low intensity. The only way you'll get a big fire is if you've got shrubs burning. The understory is the thing that drives difficult to control fire. Now, that, to my thinking as a firefighter, that's, it's good to see in print. It's also bleeding obvious we, I, I used to conduct these fire prep days in the spring to get our firefighters thinking in f terms of fire and, and not thinking about snow as much anymore as the summer came on. And, and there were times I would throw out a measured amount of leaf litter on the ground and I'd get them to pull out their MacArthur meters and take the weather measurements and say, okay, given the weather measurements and 20 tonnes per hectare of litter fuel on the ground there, what are the flame heights going to be? if we set this on fire right here and now in the car park. And, and the MacArthur meter would say three meter high flames. Who wants to go with their gut feeling and tell me what they think the flame heights really will be? And the few brave people that came up with it said, well, knee height. And they were the right ones. Because what I needed to do was to get people questioning the nonsense science that wasn't science, that was a back of the envelope thing, nine hand drawn data points that have been since disproved completely. Um, we need, it, it, it becomes a matter of safety that people question this stuff and people know that it is wrong, that they are able to go and say, well, no, the place that is safe is the place that's just got leaf litter and doesn't have shrubs. If I'm in amongst the shrubs there, then I'm going to have bigger flames. Michael Storey led a, a study looking at a, a huge number of line scans. They're infrared uh, images of, of wildfires burning in, in all ranges of conditions. And again, found absolutely no relationship. He says almost no linear relationship. Now, if you don't know what R squared means, is it's a measure of how much that explains. So if you've got an R squared of one, then fuel load explains all of it. If you've got an R squared of 0 0.001, saying almost no linear relationship is like, <laughs> like saying I almost can't move the moon with my mind. You know, it's, we, it, there is no relationship there. So the other part of it, of this work that came out of the longleaf pine was this concept of fire intensity. And again, a really simple idea. Uh, fuel has energy stored in it. The faster you burn that energy, the faster you release it. And so the amount of kilowatts of energy released is related to the amount of fuel and the speed with which it's burning. So ultimately what it comes down to is multiply fuel load by rate of spread. Um, Combine that with the fact that if you double the, with the, the claim that if you double the fuel load, you double the rate of spread, then you've got a really strong argument saying all we've got to do is reduce the fuel load. Um, and so we have situations like a prescribed burn that I studied in the southwest. I was looking at um, these guys, western ringtail possums. Why are this guy living in that hollow? Um, prescribed burn was conducted in this area. They're a critically endangered species. 
there's, uh, the, the numbers have crashed so dramatically in the last few decades. Um, but there was one tiny little urban reserve of Tuart Woodland uh, where there was a remnant population of these possums that were surviving there. Now, the, the guidelines for burning in this community are that you conduct it at a really low intensity. Two ways to get low intensity, either have really low fuel loads or really low rate of spread. Because remember, it's rate of spread times fuel load. So the people that conducted the burns did it exactly by the book, perfectly followed it through. Um, they wanted to burn these bulgar grass trees here. Um, so they set them on fire, and that's what a bulgar looks like when it's on fire. And here's the hollow where the possum lives. Can you see an issue? I, um, the, the fire model that I developed, Frame, Fire Research and Modelling Environment, one of the things that it does is it calculates the effect of the flames on the surrounding environment as well. And um, I did some calculations for that particular scenario there. And what it shows is that the air around the hollow got to over 500 degrees. And this red line is the temperature inside the hollow, which was hot enough that if the possum stayed in situ there, then its respiratory tracts would have burned, even though it's very well insulated from outside. Um, quite likely, it seems this individual didn't stay in the hollow, that as soon as the flame started, coming around the hollow there, it tried to escape. And apologies uh, for the photo, but this is the reality of things. This is that guy. 77% of the population were annihilated by a prescribed burn conducted exactly to the rules, to the guidelines to preserve these, because it was based on really, really bad science that had been taken from leaf litter of pine needles in longleaf pine forests and applied unquestioningly to Australia. And even though we knew a whole lot of it was wrong, it's still in practice, it's still applied today. It's still the basis for prescribed burning today. And it's still the reason why every time there is a fire, we say, well, Aboriginal people must have burnt more than we do because the fuel loads must have been lower because we still interpret it all through this concept of dodgy science that we know is wrong. There's a second bit to this, and that is that's what changes does this make? We can see that, that the fire science there is, 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 is wrong. But how do we manage fire? Well, early uh, colonists were able to see changes in the bush as it transitioned away from Aboriginal fire use and towards colonial fire use. Um, in the Snowies, there was the observation that the graziers there were burning the shrubs to get rid of them, to create more grazing land, but the more they burnt, the more shrubs they got back. And it just kept accelerating. Um, but that wasn't just in the Snowies. In southwestern Australia, and Charles Lane Poole became conservator of forests, um, and he, he noticed this in so many different places. And he, he said, all of the old people tell me this. They see this, that um, you had forests that were, had no fire as long as anybody knew of, and they were beautiful open forests. And as soon as you started burning them, they thickened up and they became uh, these fire traps. And if we leave them unburnt, they can open up again. Now, a lot of people have criticised him because he studied ecology in Europe and they said, oh, he's bringing his European ideas here. What he was saying was, was not based on the, the theory of it. He was saying based off the observations of people who had seen fire change this country. Um, again, Dr Neil Burrows in the 90s looked at this for Jarrah forests and what he showed was that um, if you burn a jarra forest, this is years since fire, this is the, the weight of understory, um, he calls it understory fuel quantity or total biomass. Um, so the difference is that the, what he's calling fuel there is the finest parts of the plants. You take an area like this, which looks like this, that's a, a 60 years unburnt jarra forest, and you burn it 
and it will be it will be open at first. Same weight of understory fuels, and remember, the understory is what drives fire, according to the project Vesta work. Same weight of those understory fuels about a year after fire, as you've got 60 years after fire. If you leave it unburnt at a 60 year block, it'll stay open like that. If you leave it unburnt here, then five years later, it looks like this. Now, this was just a very mild fire. The farmer that owned this land here was able to put it out single-handedly. It's not that it was an intense thing that, that, that caused it all. That's just what happens with the bush there. And a couple of decades ago, Ray Specht came up, or well, more than a couple decades ago, came up with this principle that he was, he was pushing, saying basically that if you, if you have tall plants and disturbance removes the tall plants, then they're going to regrow again from the ground. You remove the overstory and you get more understory. And he showed this for a, a wide range of ecosystems across Australia. Um, and so he considered this basically a universal principle across Australia. You remove the overstory, you get dense understory growth. So coming back again to this finding from, um, from Project Vesta, um, we can see why they've, they've made this conclusion. This is, again, looking at my prescribed burn. Now, the interesting thing about this prescribed burn is that the shrubs that it's burning here that are producing these big flames are a species, Divisium mimosoides. I went out to a number of these burns where the field officers who were conducting these burns, they were, um, they were often just you know, tradies or farmers from the area who'd managed to get some work with national parks. Um, they weren't, they weren't um, lobbying for anything. They weren't greenies by background or anything like that. They just, this was just a job for them. But they got out there and they'd been conducting these burns year after year. And there were times we had almost outright revolt on our hands where these guys would, were almost refusing to conduct these burns because those shrubs only grew where we'd burnt. If we didn't burn, we only had the litter. And they said, we've made this entire fire problem here. And it's because so many places respond in this way here. You, you burn it, you get this flush of growth, and that's lasting decades. That's decades for that to clear out again. Now, that's all fine in theory, you might say, um, but what about in reality? Um, last year, I published a paper with a couple of other fellows where we looked through um, fire histories across Southwest WA and we examined those records and just asked a simple question. In each burn footprint, did that fire favour a certain age range more than another one? Did it, was it more likely to burn a particular age range than another one? And what we found was stark. Fire loves this dense shrubby growth. The theory is holding up, but then it declines again. This is what has happened. None of this is theory. Everything before this was theory. This is what has happened. The problem is that you get this period right at the beginning here where straight after fire, you've got low fire risk. And the prescribed burning program is there to get as much country into that really young age range as possible. But because we physically can't burn enough country to do that, even in Southwest WA where they do so much burning that, that we're a joke over here on the east with our 10,000 hectare piddling little burns, um, two thirds of their forest is maintained in this age range here, right at its most flammable. So what's, what's the solution to this? Is it, well, we've, you know, it's, it's just a bad thing. We've just got to stop doing it. I think there's even more to it than this. And this is where I'm going to tie the ecology in with the fire behaviour and show, because I want to make it clear, I don't claim to be an expert on Indigenous fire at all. Anything that I'm telling you are, are tiny little bits that people have been generous enough to share with me. My field is fire behaviour. I'm coming from someone saying, my lot have got some responsibility here 
in continuing some bad science, which I think is silencing these old guys who've got the knowledge. Um, and we need to stop saying that stuff. We need to stop telling people who, who try to bring in nuanced arguments that you guys don't know what you're talking about because the fuel load. Um, because we know the fuel load is wrong. We know that argument doesn't work. What is fuel load? There are people, you know, who will say that it's just the little load. Others will say it's the shrubs. But if you look at it, fuel is anything that's burning. So in this instance here, the fire is just burning the litter on the ground. But what if you had a crown fire? Then the trees are fuel. Everything's fuel in that instance, all of the fine materials there. And so what tends to happen in, uh, in the broader literature, the stuff that's not applying directly into a fire behaviour model, what tends to happen is that people will draw back and they will refer to fuel as biomass or as carbon. Now think of the implications of that. Biomass, bio life, the mass of life. We're not counting our own mass in that. It's not us, it's them. It's all of the other lives. All the other lives across the landscape make up the biomass. And the more biomass there is, the more fuel there is, the more hazard, the more danger there is to us. That's the narrative. Think of the implications of that. Think of the implications of calling it carbon. The more carbon storage there is in the landscape, the more risk there is to us. This is what has come of, this is the implication of what we've been calling fire science all this time. So my work was to, to build this model frame where I basically try to work out, will fire ignite this thing or not? And if it does, uh, how will it behave? And, and to give you a rough idea, to get a, a single flame height prediction takes roughly half a million calculations. It's a complicated model. And a lot of people look at it and say, no, that's too complicated, but we have computers. They do the hard bit. <laughs> so what it tells us is that if we just have litter, we've got a really small flame. If we add some shrubs to that, we then get a larger flame. If we add larger shrubs to that, we'll get an even bigger flame. So far, agreeing with all of the stuff that's come out of Project Vesta from that empirical work there. Um, but then Frame adds in something else because you can see here that the trees aren't burning and yet those trees are influencing this fire. How is that? You stand outside on a windy day and if you've got a head shape like mine, your hat will blow off. But if you go in underneath the trees, the trees will protect you. It's a lot less wind under the trees. So the more vegetation you've got above the fire that isn't burning, the slower the wind speed is acting on the fire. So now all of a sudden, biomass of plants can either be acting as fuel or it can be acting as what I call overstory shelter. It can either be feeding the fire or slowing it down, calming it. Biomass is no longer the boogeyman. All other lives than us don't have to be feared. Coming back to Ray Specht's idea, if this is the case that uh, if we remove the overstory, then it'll be compensated by an increase in understory, then the inverse of that is likely also true, that if you allow that forest to mature, then eventually that understory turns into taller plants. And if we tie that back into what I've been talking about and what Frame predicts is that those taller plants there that have, um, that have now outcompeted, that have now outcompeted the shrubs underneath them, um, those shrubs are gone, so you've lost that flame from underneath there, and now this tiny little flame can't ignite those plants. And now instead of just having trees slowing the wind, you've also got these plants slowing the wind. So the more vegetation there is acting as overstory shelter, the less there is acting as fuel, and the more that fire, that, that, that forest can calm the fire. This is what um, I've been calling ecological control theory, and I looked at it for the tingle forests, and I showed that as the tingle forests mature, 
after a lot of surveys across different ages of these forests, you get this, this dense flush of growth that the fire stimulated there, but then when that self thins as the forest gets older, you get more of this taller mid-storey and a lot less wind down on the ground there and the flames are smaller. And when you look at a forest like the Tingle, it's got these tiny little spiders that live in, in, in the lower bark of the tree, Tingle trapdoor spiders. They're just a few millimetres across. They move incredibly slowly. A lot of trapdoors can, can do this thing called ballooning where they basically make a little, little net of, of, of spider web and they can catch a breeze and relocate to new places. Tingle trapdoors can't do that. They live right at the base of the trees. They don't dig a hole in the ground as a trapdoor. They actually make a little mound of, of, of broken bits of bark over themselves. So the tiniest, mildest fire that reaches that tree kills them. And then it's going to take forever for them to recolonise. Now, you might be somebody who thinks, well, you know, I don't care very much about spiders. But think of the reality of this. Before we were here to save the forests from themselves, all of these, for all of these tingle trapdoors survived for how many millions of years? How did they do that? And the answer, in my mind, is ecological controls. Forests are able to survive with fire. They came to us with this huge suite of fire sensitive species that are now disappearing at an incredible rate of knots. And First Nations were able to cooperate with these processes. The reason Uncle Wayne says we kept fire out is precisely because of ecological controls. He didn't call it that. That's just my way of making it sound smart. But um, you leave those forests unburnt. If you, if you burn them, you get this. Now, admittedly, not all prescribed burns will give you a scorched canopy. Some, some do, some don't. But whatever the situation, you get this dense regrowth. But 60, 70 years after fire, it's open like that. And you've got more shade overhead. So it's a cooler, moister environment. Fire is now rare in there. Uncle Wayne and his mob knew this. They worked with this. Now, some people will say, but what's the good of that country when it's really old? In the US, in the Pacific Northwest, they had areas of Douglas fir that were 500,000 years old and people were calling them biological deserts. And the reason they called them that was because there were barely any ecological studies that had found, found you know, populations of the animals they were interested in. And that's the key thing. They were interested in animals that they saw as useful, deer that they could shoot. Not many of them. There's spotted owls. Spotted owls managed to virtually kill the forestry industry in that part of the country there because they had to be protected. Not a popular bird. There are a lot of other things that lived in, up in the tops of these enormous trees where nobody's looking. But it wasn't just that they're up out of eyesight, it was the fact that they weren't considered useful to us. Nobody was interested in them. So people will look at areas like this and like uh, Stephen Pine said, unless you burn country, it is biologically locked up and unusable. Now, what if you were Wadandi though? These guys look nice to eat. I'm a vegetarian, but even I can see. <laughs> The longer you leave Tingle Forest unburnt, this is um, uh, Carleen Bain's work in WA, the longer you leave the Tingle Forest unburnt, the more quokkas there are. So if you want a food supply, you want forest that looks like this. I mean, that's, that's one of the species there. They love this sword sedge. Um, a lot of things do. You get more of the ringtail possums in this old country. You, it, it, there's, there's a lot of different species that really start moving into this country when it gets old. Those guys, we like them because you see photos on Instagram and they look like they're smiling and, you know, they, they're, um, they're a cute animal. A hundred years ago, they weren't popular. In the early 20th century, they were classed as vermin. And the reason why is because they love eating the, the shoots of new regrowth trees. And so if you are uh, a culture that 
that prospers by moving across the landscape and taking a whole lot at once and changing the landscape as the culture was there where they were clear filling these forests. You've now got these great big areas of regrowth and the quokkas loved it. And, and it became quite clear that if you've got old growth forest like this near all of your regrowth there, you will lose your saplings. They were one of the biggest threats to the forestry industry in Southwest WA. So Wadandi well, loved them, my lot didn't. And it comes back to something really fundamental. In ecology, we often divide species up um, into, um, we call them R strategists and K strategists based on an equation and everybody, you know, if you're an ecologist, you'd nod your head and everybody else is now in a, in a different place than the ecologists in our thinking. But, Basically, it means you've got animals that like to live fast and die young, breed up really fast, um, take over things as quick as you can. Think of rabbits and locusts and weeds and lantana and, you know, things like that that, that take off, do really, really well, and then once they've decimated everything, there's a big crash and they disappear. And then you've got the K strategists, which are the ones that are in there for the long haul, um, you know, think of elephants and um, animals that, that can live for a long time. They're not trying to breed up. They're not trying to take over everything. They're there to persist. And so you get a wave of these invasive species come through and, and take off in an area, but then they die out and the case strategists are still there at the end of it and still plodding on and persisting. Humans have the possibility of being either. We have a choice. We, we get to decide how we, get, how we live in this. If you survive for 65,000 years like First Nations did, you're pretty much a case strategist. You've, you've learnt how to persist. Um, if you come into an area and your whole thing is about moving through it like locusts and just clear fill this area, take all of this stuff, change this whole landscape, then we are one of the live fast, die young species. And one of the things with these our strategists is that they love disturbed spaces. You, you scrape a, spat, a, a patch of grass on the side of the road and you will get weeds there. It's the R strategists come into disturbed spaces. We have now in, in colonial culture, in invasion culture, we have this approach that likes disturbed spaces. We get most of our produce from disturbed spaces, not these biologically locked up unusable spaces. But the nations that persisted for 65,000 years or more before us and are still persisting in parts of the country, they know how to do this thing which I call cooperation with country which from a fire perspective means that you are not trying to take this top-down control and just say it's all biomass, it's all got to be reduced, we have to be the species on top. Instead, you are saying that I am one of these species. There is a, a tradition in many nations along the east coast of, of New South Wales um, about uh, one of the creator spirits was Daramulan. And the, the Dakanung people sort of in the, in the Wallamai northwest of Sydney would have a thing every year uh, called the Bobung where they, um, it was on their country but nations from all the surrounding countries would come and gather at Mount Yango and um, you know, sort of young teens who were kind of being initiated would end up going out into the bush and they would meet uh, Daramulan out in the bush and he would give them kinship with a species. Um, there's a lot of different names for it. You were referring to it as totems. Yep, um, Uncle Rod uh, uh, calls it bagal, um, kinship with another species. You now are related to another species and that then relates you to people in another nation, one of your surrounding nations. It, it, it influences who you are and aren't allowed to marry. Um, and, what, and it makes these ties. Kinship gives you ties across borders where you wouldn't have had them before. So now you've got a brother or a sister in that other nation. 
And that's going to slow you down before you think about going to war. You now speak for this other species. So if somebody says, I want to go out and, and you know, collect all the quokkas, if, if you have kinship with the quokkas, you are speaking and you will defend that quokka. You will stand up in defence of these species and there will be somebody who has kinship with one of these species. And before you can do anything that affects them, you have to ask permission from them. And they might be a 13-year-old girl, but they've got the authority to speak for that species and they can stop your actions. They have, they have the power of veto over these things. And it's an incredible system. And the thing is, in one of these traditions, Durramullan is locked within trees. He lives within trees. And the way you hear him speak is by the wind in the trees. And so these Mount Yango meetings were happening each spring with nations coming from hundreds of kilometres in either direction. Similar things happened in the snowies there and we, we've heard about you know, people going and eating bogong moths there. But the Mount Yango ones, if you are from where I'm living now in Darawal country, you might be standing in a rainforest. And when you hear that wind come and it's roaring on those ridge lines above you, you know that that wind has, has come from high Gundungra country. Um, you've got these spring gales coming through. They're coming from the west. And in that higher Gundungra country, you've got people out there who themselves have stood on these ridge lines and seen this wind come roaring up there and there's a bit of snow with it and you've got the flocks of black cockatoos crying on the front of it there and they're, you know, it's an incredible thing. And all of them, you know that's where that thread of wind has come from. It's a story that has come across the landscape to you. And... What you're hearing is the voice of Dara Mullen saying, come to the mountain and remember kinship because kinship is the thread, the web that ties us together. This is the thing that makes us all work, makes us survive for 65,000 years. The fact that it is not us versus them, it's not us or the biomass, it, we are part of it. And colonial Australia has come in and has snipped through those threads one by one. We've moved people off country. We've broken storylines. We've caused divisions between different groups, broken those kinship ties. And so we see so much splintering happening in society and our bad fire science that has totally changed this story has turned it on its head from you are one of the lives living in this landscape here. You have kinship with all of these other lives around you. We've turned that story on its head and we've said that it's you or them. That's fuel. That's got to be reduced. And we know it's wrong. We know that isn't science. Let me finish. And I'm probably way over time because I haven't been paying attention, sorry. Uh, oh, Couple of things, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Got to come back to settler mimicry burning. See, that country down on the Snowy River where settlers apparently mimicked the burning. In 1970, there was a fellow that collected stories from the Rogers family who lived in that country. And they wrote about what they had done and they had said, yes, yes, we did burn this every three or four years here. We were trying to produce grass for the stock to feed on. And the effect of it was that we turned this open bush into dense scrub. Now, some of that scrub along the Buchan River Valley where the study was conducted was dense eucalypt regrowth. The study found this massive increase in eucalypts and attributed it to saying, well, settler mimicry burning was stopped and therefore Aboriginal burning was stopped because they were essentially the same thing. And, um, and as a result, all of this growth came up. That's what we get when we don't understand the ecology of, of how these forests work. Once we understand how forests work, that if you take away plants from up here, they regrow from down here, then it starts making sense. 
And this is why Richard take, takes people through his country and he says, have a look at this tree here. You can see at the base of this tree where the soil used to be. And all of that soil has been washed away because they burnt it so often. And all of these colitis trees are all of a certain age because they came up like wheat in the late 1800s after all of the soil was washed away, after it was burnt. And he said, we need to respect this country and rest this country. We need to let it recover and it's going to take a long time. And he's such a fierce advocate for that country. He inspires me because the thing is, as we are now handing over country back to the people who actually own the country, we're giving them disturbed bush like this, country that we have come in as a locust plague and it's recovering from us. And people are looking at that and they're saying, well, that's not right. It shouldn't be dense like that. And we've come in with this bad science and said, well, the only way to open it up is to thin it or to, to burn it more and more. Um, and you've got to stomp down. I, I came from a tradition that, that used this language. Um, uh, it, 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 this is a... This is a, a a common theme across religions that have come from the Fertile Crescent, um, one of the birthplaces of, of modern agriculture that defines us, is language of subdue the earth. Why would, why would that be an ethic that we have to subdue the earth? It's because it's from the birthplace of agriculture. The word subdue was a Hebrew word, kabash, literally means stomp it underfoot. We are the masters. We have to take mastery and ownership of this country. And so our only answer is that needs a firmer hand. And because nobody knows, nobody is passing on the ecology of this anymore, nobody is saying, well, if you leave it alone, it turns into this. So how do, how do we reconcile that with the fact that we know uh, burning is part of Indigenous tradition and now... I'll finish with this story that Uncle Rod has said I'm allowed to pass on. This is an area where Rod used to come as a child. His family would come up from the south coast. They would dance on this naturally clear patch that turns into swamp at certain times of the year. This area was called Wadbilliga, the ribbon country. They were camped here at the base of a mountain called Diligumbra. Diligumbra was the rainmaker for the area. And so they'd come into rain country and they'd camp here in rain country. And, and Rod showed me that in a few places around the area, you've got these shrubs, G-bungs like this one and various other shrubs there. And he said, you won't find them further out. They're just around these campsites here. And so they'd stay here until the people who had bagal kinship with matruk wattle, acacia dilbada, watched it. And when the flowers dropped from the matruk, they would say, it's time and the rain men would watch Dilagambra, and when Dilagambra got cloud on his head, they'd say, we're leaving today, and they'd walk up the hill, and they'd say, Budidi um, thank you for your country, it's good country, and they'd throw out a fire stick into the bush, and then they'd walk away and they'd cross the Monero grasslands, head into Tidbilliga, the, the higher mountains, spend the summer there, then in the autumn they'd come back again, and they'd be bringing with them fruits, these fruits, from the snowies to cross the grasslands and they'd eat these fruits back at the campsite here and the reason they were growing at the campsite was because they're spitting the seeds out around this campsite here and then there'd be groves of these shrubs there waiting with food for them when they got back. Now if you were a really progressive farmer at the time there and wanted to know what was going on you might say well, what do you do with fire and you get the four-year-old answer well we throw a fire stick into the bush every year. But if you listened to the full story, if you sat down, and this took me a few years to, until I got to the point of hearing this, what you got was a, an understanding that there's a specific time of the year. It's a time when the flowers are on Acacia Dilbada. Just when those flowers drop is the time when you leave and you wait for an exact weather pattern where the cloud is sitting on this mountain here. Now, if you do prescribe burning, part of a burn prescription is that you have to have a right set of weather conditions. This gives you an exact dew point. You've got an exact altitude for the base of that cloud there. You've got a weather pattern with easterlies coming into you from the sea. Um, 
So they take a little while. Once the cloud hits there, you throw your fire stick out and you've then got another hour or so before those easterlies hit and they're really moist and that cloud just turns into fog across that landscape there. And by, by lighting a single point ignition on the top of the hill, you've got a slow spreading little fire that spreads out from there and you can afford to walk away from it because that cloud comes in and puts it out. And so each year you're burning this tiny little patch. Now the guy that just got the four year old answer thinks, okay, we've got to burn it every year. But by understanding this, you now understand that it's a tiny little patch each year. And what does that patch do? Well, remember that fire stimulates that understory growth. And we want the understory here because the understory is the food right around the campsite. Nothing to do with fuel reduction, like you said, Dave. It's, um, you know, you, you want the fuel. You want the shrubs here around the campsite because they are your food. If you light too big a fire, then there's no food to come back to in the autumn. If you light too small a fire, then you're not regenerating enough of these plants and you'll eventually run out. So you need to know the story. You need to know which mountain is Gillagumbra. You need to have people who have kinship with that specific wattle to know the time of the year. You break any one of those threads and you lose the power of that management. You lose that science. And so what I want to say out of this is that we as um, colonial Australia have downgraded that knowledge and seen it as primitive. And yet when it's taken seriously and when our science starts to catch up, when we reject the stuff that we know is wrong and instead start taking into account basic ecological principles and observable facts like the fact that flames from a burning plant are bigger than flames from leaves on the ground, once we start accounting for reality, then our stories converge. And what we need, again, is to give the microphone to these people who are very often old, quiet people hiding out in the background who don't want the attention but they're the people we need to hear from because these are the stories that will start to reconstruct the way we see fire in the country and give us a chance to cooperate with these old processes, put fire where it's useful, where it belongs, and allow other areas to develop and grow into these places that become less flammable. Thanks. We are certainly over time, Phil, but uh, the audience is enthralled, as I have been. Uh, and so, I mean, you give us a history lesson, you've taught us about the ecology of some of these forests that we thought we knew about, uh, but we've learned new things just from the hour and a little bit you've been speaking. Uh, so thank you very much. But I just want to, perhaps, Dave, can you come up again? Just give us a few more reflections now that you've heard the conclusion of what Phil's had to say uh, before we ask for some questions from yeah. the audience, or but perhaps of both of you. Yeah, um, thanks for that. I've been sitting there saying, this is what I've been talking about all the time. And just at the very end, uh, what you said was absolutely right. There are them old fellas and them old women out there that have this knowledge, and we're just waiting for the modern science to catch up with what we've always known. And that's the big shift in scientists, I think. Um, in the dealings with um, anything to do with Aboriginal so-called myths or legends or no longer applicable ways of living, um, they use science to disprove everything that we've done. Now I see the shift where science is actually looking for taking our knowledge and not disproving it, but actually using science to back up what we've always known. And you've done an absolutely fantastic presentation of that and uh, I don't know whether we'll ever catch up again uh, face to face, but I've got your email now, so you might hear from me. Um, an absolutely fantastic piece of work, but it, it, yeah, people ask me about fire, and the simple answer is, right fire for right country at the right time, which is still the four-year-old's answer, 
But if, it, if you think about it, it's like you haven't been told when, you haven't been told what yep. country, yep. and that's the longer story that takes a lot of learning to do. I didn't learn it overnight. I started learning after the 2009 bushfires, uh, around 2015 when uh, community recognised me with having fire knowledge uh, and then coming de back down to Victoria and trying to apply it. Uh, and they said, oh, so you're a firefighter? I said, no, I'm a fire manager, supported by my community. And they said, well, you can't burn. Uh, and that was it. I was told, as, as an Aboriginal, not trained firefighter, you can't burn because I didn't have any documentary evidence that backed up the science of <coughs> Aboriginal fire. So we have to work with the science so that they can create that documentary evidence which actually backs up the things that we've been trying to do, which we are still doing very piecemeal at the moment, Lots of little small demonstration burns all around the place. But what started off in 2015 is no burning whatever for Aboriginal people, um, unless they join the CFA or Forest Fire Management. Um, the little land management team that I began in 2012 uh, now has about 80 burns on the books over the next four years. Uh, and some of these areas they've been given uh, basically carte blanche to manage it beyond the fire practice, but to manage it in general, to take in all the other responsibilities of woody weed removal, you know, re-veg works and using those modern things, and they've got it for 10 years. Hopefully we'll get it back with treaty, but we'll get it back through native title anyway because they are burning on Crown land. Um, but if we don't get that, at least there are some people out there who recognise the value of allowing Indigenous people back on their own land and not telling them what to do, Letting them do it. And that, what you've just presented tonight just backs up everything we've been trying to do. We've been fighting so hard. Um, we fight for our elders and our ancestors who passed that thing. We fight for our children into the future. And I just want to shake your hand and say thank you very much. Let's take some questions. Uh, you're welcome to ask questions of uh, Phil and Dave if you wish. There's a yeah, suit in the front here. There's a microphone coming. There you are. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Uncle Dave. Dave um, yes, I've been following Uncle Dave for some years now and definitely appreciate what he has to say, which makes me ask you, Phil, if we follow Uncle Dave's advice and care for country, I can assume then that we're likely to have less wild or bushfires, and if so, how do we get this narrative across to our wonderful government? <laughs> Uh, I, I suppose the the first thing is is we've got now quite a long period of messing things up. It's going to take a while for things to fix up, and I think it one of one of the hazards now is the the perception that if we just after having made this mess, just say here you go, Dave. You fix yeah. this up. <laughs> now it should be all right, and the bushfires are going to be his fault. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, it's not going to happen straight away. Like, these forests are going to take a while to recover. And, and if we've got Dave and Rod and Uncle Wayne and all of these people out there um, doing things with right-way fire, um, what it's going to mean is that, yes, we, we can age the places that need to be aged, we can keep fire where it belongs there because, you know, I look at some of these these treatments where, you know, you had really, really frequent fire following these these storylines through the country, song lines through the country there, and, and you've got lines of, of young, really recently burnt country. So it's it's getting burnt again before it gets to that thick scrubby stage. There, you're using if you if you think of that that graph where you start out low with shrubs, it gets high, then it drops down low again. You're using both ends of that graph. Your main countryside is that that open area that that's been allowed to age, but then you've got these really intensively burnt areas there, and that combination of thinking, I think, will in time um, reduce our risk. It will break up some of those areas because while we're getting through that hump of really flammable country, it's, it's going to be hell for a while and it's going to need 
a lot of investment in firefighting technology to try and balance out um, what what are the effects of our ongoing management and also the effects of climate change, which which may you know we're we're still in the early stages. Who knows how bad this is going to get? So I I wouldn't want to say well it can all be fine now. It's um, I I think we're actually at the point of of saying I think we know a better way, yeah. but whether it's enough now or whether it will happen in time or whether we've broken things completely is a hard question, but what else can we do other than say, I will fight with every last little bit that I've got to try and try and make this right now? I don't know what you yeah, think. Just, we, can, we can accuse and abuse of the government not doing the right thing. Um, we all love doing that. We're Australian. It's like it's a national pride. It's a national right. But we can start to think that if the government won't do it or can't do it or is too afraid to do it, where can we do it where the government doesn't have influence? And that is private land. What we're talking about with the bushfires and everything, else, it is all about crown land, government... You know, forest fire management, they manage crown land, they pay our forest reserves, they don't manage your backyard. But what you can do as a demonstration is learn from Aboriginal fire knowledge holders in your own backyard. That's if you're lucky enough these days to have a couple of acres in your backyard. And you can actually apply these principles in a, in a very, very safe manner. And if nothing else, it will protect your house if your surrounding forest does catch on fire. Let's and you can, can demonstrate. Let's we'll see if we can get yeah. a couple more questions, yeah. otherwise we'll get very late. Okay, <laughs> sorry, yeah. Where's your microphone, Scott? There, to the... Oh, th thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Does that, you can hear that one. Yeah. And thank, thank you, Uncle Dave, and thank you, Phil. And I guess in, in this example you gave, where this very small area was burnt, but all the area around wasn't burnt, like the wet forests in Western Australia and our wet forests, with the work of Beth Gott, weren't burnt. Mm. What terms do you have? I guess we keep talking about the burning, which is this little spit. What term do we have? How do we change the narrative of what we don't burn? Yeah. Um, you, yeah. From a science perspective, or what you've discovered anyway. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because in New South Wales, uh, you look at the Rural Fires Act there um, and the definition of hazard reduction is, is a fire regime that, that maintains the forest in its basically its lowest risk state, but it specifies that it has to be managed into that. There has to be some subdue the earth that goes into it to get it there. And so if you say, I'm going to let that forest age, there will be the argument that, well, that's a do-nothing approach. But I would put that we, we are one of the species and we are here to cooperate with these existing systems that worked long before we got here. And so I think that's it, it's going to come down to us getting some of these terms changed. We, we can't call it hazard reduction anymore if it's actually making the forest more flammable by germinating all of those plants. Um, we have to say that hazard reduction is anything that reduces the hazard. And so that may mean um, really frequent fires around a campsite like that. Um, maybe that's, you know, that's, that's germinating some, some shrubs in some areas, but but in other instances, they were burning around campsites to specifically to keep it open there. So they burnt really, really frequently, and it was a form of clearing. Um, that's one form of hazard reduction there. Allowing forests to age in another area so that they naturally thin is another form of hazard reduction, and we have to be able to call it what it is. And, and I, I'm hesitant, I suppose, to bring in too many new terms. I think the more we can use the, the terms we've got but use them correctly, 
then, um, yeah, the better. Second, there's a question from someone for our big online audience, I think. Is that you, Kachurna? Yep. Thank you. There are many questions online around management, which you've already sort of touched on, but I'm going to sort of pull a few questions together. Um, obviously, you know, this is a very, very big continent, lots of different types of trees and lots of, sorry, lots of different forests. So perhaps the two of you can answer this together um, about the parallels of how planned burns alter fire behaviour between like different types of forests, so the southwestern forests that you studied and then the southeastern forests here. Uh, landscapes are landscapes or forests are forests. They're all different. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There, there are all different types of country. And um, going back to the last question, hopefully answer this question as well, um, there are management strategies for all parts of country that governments have prescribed. And because it's prescribed that they must go back and revisit whether it's got those elevated fuel loads, then they make a decision based on that thing and they will go in and burn it. But what we should be having is a fire management strategy that is an overall landscape strategy, but understanding that not, there is not one blanket strategy to cover all pieces of country. You need to actually identify your ecological values within a system, not just our forests, but our wetlands and our grasslands, and you build a management strategy, including fire, about when it can, or whether it if, or should not ever be applied. So you can burn around pieces of country to protect an area that doesn't ever need to be burnt. Uh, in, in classic example is our uh, rainforest, which a few years ago, uh, one of the, for the rainforests, um, we had that east to west, sorry, west to east fire right across New South Wales. And it actually got into one of the rainforests. And it wasn't until it got in the rainforest where they rang up the Aboriginal people and said, could you come and help us with this fire because we want to protect the rainforest. It's because they took the people out of the landscape for the last 200 years if they, and they'd been told, let us back in there. Because otherwise, if you don't, that rainforest is going to burn and that should never burn. So it is about this listening and, and including Aboriginal people in the conversation about the long-term management of all of our country. There's a man at the back had his hand up since uh, for a while. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, g'day, uh, Dave and uh, Phil. I was actually just going to comment on topics that both of you have spoken about, and I think most non-Indigenous Australians just totally overlook that and, and uh, feel something that I'm always on about as, a, as an Aboriginal person, so I'm proud Gunich Mara man, uh, is that thing of about how you place yourself when you are learning from any community. And, and Dave, you've just um, mentioned that about, you know, the different knowledge systems within those. And I think that we have to step it back a few steps so that we actually know how to learn before we can even take those steps that we're talking about here. You know, people get tied up in all the, the you know, and that's that white fellow way of thinking about, you know, the, the, uh, all the, the little numbers, all the facts and figures, but you've actually got to learn about how to learn first, yeah? And I think, uh, Phil, you know, it's really, really refreshing to sit here and actually listen to you as a white fellow that's sitting here, uh, standing there, telling us about uh, and, and relating your learning journey there, if that makes sense, yeah? Thanks. Yeah, that's right. So everybody says to me, well, can't you record all this knowledge, Uncle Dave? And I'm, well, you know what? I hate writing. I live in an oral society. But we need people like the science to actually walk that country with us, listen to our stories as you've done with Uncle Rod and, and the other people that, that you've presented about, and you've taken them at their word, and you've taken that knowledge and put it into a, in a conversation or into a documentation, which can be taken to a community um, that we probably, as Aboriginal people, would probably not get to work with. And so that the information is there, and that's, that's how we'll preserve our nature. But of course, that does lead you down the path of whose intellectual property is it? Because you wrote it down, do you own it? Or is it our, our property? Yeah, yeah. And how, does that, how, how do we prevent that being commercialised and misused because a black fellow said we could? Yep. And I think yeah, this yeah. is at the point that I, you might make a comment, Phil, is that um, you've also made this point about the need to disassemble 
some existing white man science, like the guy in mm. Texas with the mm. uh, gardens and guns, mm. and that needs to be done at the same time yeah. as some new learning. Yes. We need to ch challenge yeah. what's been, I forget what, how you described it, but this thread that's been managed to survive, mm. and we've based a lot of the practice on that. I think we'll just take your question and then build the back afterwards. Thank you. Um, it was said earlier that no one really cares when the snakes get burned in the fires and it's not entirely true. I run a research and conservation program on a snake that's been burnt out of the national parks in northwestern Victoria. It's Mallee country. It's not forest per se but um, we, we've done years and years of trapping in an area where this animal was once common. It, it's gone. Well, well it's, sorry, it's not gone. It's undetectable basically. We've then extended our trapping onto long unburnt private land and there it is. Uh, in good numbers, and there's a couple of other species that are doing the same. Of course, there are winners as well. There are things that love the, the recently burned. The, the question I have is, and it comes back to what this lady said to start us off, um, whether the difference needs to come via the agencies that are doing the burning. So, you know, it, it's not even the science community, it's, the, it's often the land management. Have you had victories here and ha do you have advice for those of us? Because when I, I've tried to raise this and, and I'm still doing that mm. and we hit that brick wall and part of it is that these agencies have big budgets and they, they've got a lot of staff with fire in their job titles. So it's a big ship to turn around and, I, and I'm, I'm looking for guidance if you have any. Thank you. So going back to me earlier on talking about the, the snake being burnt, that was people who were taught modern fire science and this is the prescription, this is what we burn and we're burning to protect... A, uh, a very rare grassland and I was there as part of their blackout crew and when the fire went through and I said this is not the right way to do it and I walked through and I said yeah there was three snakes that got burnt they, they couldn't get out the fire was too intense it was done in a ring got closed in they couldn't get out um, so that was no one's fault because they were still burning for what they were told that they had to achieve um, it is, so I've been working with them, uh, and it was a council crew, not a forest fire management, um, and a couple of them now work for, for me um, in, in our uh, Aboriginal team. There does need to be a shift in the firefighting services or the fire management services that we've got, and it is slowly starting to happen, but it's usually happening to the people on the ground. It's the ones in the middle that are making decisions that send people out and say, you've got to burn that is where we need to start making the shift. And that needs people above them to get them on board. Um, it's happening. It's happening in some parts better than others. If you go out to Jar 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 country and talk about how their involvement with forest fire management, they've got a great relationship. Uh, they can do a lot more and they, uh, so they're you know, sharing that knowledge between each other and they're so slowly shifting the way that fire is management. It's not about handing it back to the Indigenous people, but it's having the Indigenous people influence how the day-to-day -day operations is being done. Um, but people, uh, white people, I hate to use that word, uh, modern fire, they go in there for a specific purpose, and if there are casualties, that's not our fault because we were told to do it. Everything's a casualty in a fire. Um, and I, when I was bringing the thing up about the snake is that uh, it is a totemic symbol um, and it's our responsibility. If we're going to light a fire, we need to be um, lighting the fire to not only do what the outside people want, but light the fire what's best for what's in that country at the time. So, yes, I'm not about going out and burning any animals. Uh, purposely, we did not go out and burn the land so we could go and pick up the dead kangaroo. We burnt the land so we could go to the grasses that the kangaroos would come in. There's a whole philosophy around that. The methodology about your burning, the, where we need to change the rhetoric, and it's by using the science uh, to back up that rhetoric and conversations that I am seeing a shift. And it's, in different, it's different in different parts of the country, but we will get there. We will get there. Let's take our last question. Uh, Phil? Thanks, Rob. Um, thanks, Phil and Dave, for a very interesting talk. Um, the question I have is, why is one critical factor in forest management and forest management and fire completely overlooked and that's the obliteration of millions of small native marsupials from our forests small wallabies yep. uh, betongs bandicoots they've gone now surely they worked in partnership with indigenous burning yep. but you never hear 
that factor discussed in any of these discussions? Is there a reason for that? You're absolutely right. Um, so we may not be able to be able to go back to the way that Aboriginal burning did happen in those places where those animals have been lost, because they are actually part of our management tool. You know, so if we do go out and if uh, oh let's go back and do some Aboriginal prescribed burning, um, you actually have to do extra management on top of that, because of all of those smaller marsupials that are no longer there, they're not doing the work that would um, benefit after we've done the burning. And that is a really, really hard problem. We can never get back to doing traditional cultural burning because we don't have the other animals that worked alongside that burn. And it is a big issue. We've also got cats and foxes, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. L let's... You got any more to no, say let, on that? Let's yeah. conclude there uh, and let these, uh, give these oh, guys I'll a break. No, one. it's okay. <laughs> uh, the benefit, the last discussion about how do we make change, can I encourage you all, this has all been recorded. We have this now for posterity. And can I encourage you, as we had a wonderful lecture on green chemistry last Friday night, uh, which, was, uh, which I've watched again since then, you now have the opportunity to go onto our YouTube site and share it with people who need to hear what Phil had to say and what Dave's had to say. So please do that. Do it for some uh, land managers in the Northwest. I think you might be doing it. So take that opportunity and we do this and you'll find it all, Go and watch the Green Chemistry Lecture too. You'll find that fascinating in a different way. But please do that. Uh, would you please join me in thanking uh, both Phil and Dave for their contributions tonight? It's been terrific.